Hello, happy Tuesday, everyone. Thanks for joining our live stream today. Uh, if you're watching on any of the platforms we're streaming to today, uh, we're streaming to several platforms, uh, including LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Um, be sure to uh, chime in with any questions you have. We'd love to uh, get your questions as we go through the discussion here today. I'm going to interview our guest here in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, just to give you a little bit of context, um, the supply chain, the whole function and concept of supply chain is something that's super hot and relevant right now uh, in light of inflation and uh, product shortages and delays in the supply chains. Uh, politicians in the media are even talking about the supply chain probably more than ever, at least uh, more in my adult life than I've ever seen before. So supply chain is top of mind for a lot of organizations and the broken supply chain in particular is something that's even more commonly discussed, especially as we approach the holidays and concerns about, you know, where our, will our kids get Christmas gifts in time or will we get all our gifts in time that, that we expect? Um, that's just one of many examples that we can point to of how supply chain is, is relevant today. Um, but uh, in addition to not understanding what the supply chain is and how it works, there's also a general concern in the, the uh, marketplace around why is it broken? What's wrong with the supply chain? Why is it so hard to get products to the stores or why are the shelves empty when we try to get our favorite product or, or whatever the case may be? So that's exactly what we want to talk about today is the supply chain in general, uh, why, why it's broken and um, you know, start to brainstorm some ideas on what can be done to improve the supply chain. So as part of that discussion, uh, we wanted to have a number of guests here in a panel discussion, sort of a Q&A discussion to talk about a number of different topics. I have a starting point list of questions I'll ask, but I encourage the audience to chime in with questions as well, because uh, I, have, I have enough to get us started, but I'd love to hear questions from the audience as well. And speaking of the audience, as we're right as we're introducing guests here in just a moment, if you don't mind, just drop in the chat box wherever you're watching today, just drop in the chat box where you're joining from, what city you're in, what country you're in. We'd love to see where the global audience is joining us today, because uh, we tend to generally get a, a global audience for this discussion, and certainly because the topic is global supply chain, it's even more relevant to, to a lot of people throughout the world. So drop in the chat box if you don't mind where you're joining from today, we'd love to hear from you. So to start, um, I wanna introduce our guest. Who, who, are the, uh, who are the people that are gonna be with us today talking about supply chain management? So we, in, in, we invited a few uh, experts in the supply chain world. Um, starting with, uh, we'll go around here and just do a quick introduction, starting with uh, Megan from Stopwatch. So Megan, welcome and, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and about Stopwatch. Thanks, Eric. Um, my name is Megan Bowman. I'm the founder and CEO of Stonehenge Technology Lab uh, that, that has built a, a, a robust platform called Stopwatch that's designed for consumer goods companies to be able to track all of their um, activities, uh, almost like an ERP wrapper uh, between Amazon, Target, um, anything online and offline. So uh, we kind of play in that middle space between um, you know, products coming in the back door and, and getting to the shelves uh, physically and digitally and helping uh, brands and manufacturers uh, move quickly uh, with kind of a gamified um, interface and um, kind of an ERP upgrade is what we what we like to call it. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. And so that that'll be uh, as we talk about retail and distribution and some of the things that happen on that customer facing side of the supply chain. I'm sure you'll have a lot to add there, among other things that we'll talk about here today. So uh, thanks for being here. So Amy from Kraft, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and about Kraft. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for having me, Eric. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, Kraft is a leading supplier intelligence platform, and we are helping um, supply chain and procurement professionals discover, evaluate, monitor their suppliers to create that stronger supply chain resilience that everyone's talking about today. Um, we do that through comprehensive, complete supplier data, both traditional and alternative um, data points. So everything from financial, operational, human capital, but then cybersecurity, diversity, ESG, um, you know, ad additional indicators of, of risk that by combining all of these things together, we're able to elevate those lenses and really see the total picture of what's happening rather than traditionally just looking at, for instance, a credit score. So um, my background, I am in enterprise sales with Kraft. Um, previously, I was uh, at Dun & Bradstreet 
and Gartner within their supply chain. So I've been circling risk and data and supply chain for a very long time. And I think uh, where the industry is going in terms of holistic data and looking at more than just those traditional pieces is, is really fascinating. And it's and it's driving um, some impactful results for our clients. So thank you for having me. Looking forward to the conversation today. Absolutely. Great to have you. And uh, I, I'm hearing a theme here so far. Like we're kind of talking about alternatives to your, your usual uh, ERP-ish type of software. So we'll, we'll dive into that as we get into the discussion here. So uh, last but not least, Adam from Third Stage Consulting, tell us a little bit about yourself in uh, Third Stage. Yep. So Adam Sheetham, Third Stage Consulting Group, I'm Director of Strategy and Transformation. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, so Third Stage helps with uh, clients who are trying to find a better fit of enterprise system for what it is they're doing. Um, as far as supply chain comes into it, you know, we're seeing a lot of things today with clients who are trying to get a better look at what their supply chain even looks like. You know, how, um, how do I know when things are going to show up and how do I respond to when they're going to be late? Um, and, and how do I find that out as quickly as possible, right? So uh, there's so many of our clients find out today that something's going to be late after it's very late and they want to know where where it is, where is this? Um, this uh, this raw material or this finished good that I that I ordered. So what we've been finding a lot from our clients is that's a big part of their challenge. <clears throat> we also we also have many uh, clients that are on the flip side of that where they supply a raw material which is in high demand and they can't get it out the door fast enough um, to the point where um, they're they're having they're they're losing customers because their customers are trying to find some other alternative. And so if they can't be responsive um, and, and and get their materials into the, the hands of their customers, they were losing that relationship. Um, so the we, we're seeing the supply chain shortage on, on both sides, right? And, uh, part of it from the folks that demand the supply, of course, um, but also the folks that are supplying raw materials and things like that that are necessary for uh, meeting the needs of their customers. Um, at third stage, how we help with those types of customers is, uh, and clients is by first focusing on your business processes and, and by understanding if there's anything that you can do internally without software, without um, finding new vendors or suppliers to improve your processes and get a little bit more out of the systems, maybe the systems that you already have, the processes that are in place, maybe get a little bit leaner there. Uh, maybe there's a little bit more planning that we can start looking farther ahead. Uh, think about what our lead times are. Um, not what you think they are because your system wishes that that's what they were, uh, but because uh, but uh, from a perspective of what they're actually looking like. So that's where we help a lot of this, um, and from a supply chain perspective. Got it. All right. Well, great. Well, great to have you all on the show. Thanks for thanks for being here. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. I mean, it, it, probably the the broadest, biggest question on a lot of people's minds is uh, what are some of the biggest challenges in, in the supply chain today? So I guess we'll start with you, Amy. What what are some of the biggest challenges that you see with supply chains and, the, and that your customers are seeing with supply chain management in general? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so it, it runs the gamut. So what we're seeing is there are significantly varying levels of maturity within our organiz within the organizations we're working with. And so if we think about the top challenges right now, certainly um, globalization and reshoring, right? So customers trying to think through how are we smart about bringing back some of the manufacturing? So some of the challenges with China around, you know, the tariffs and forced labor and um, obviously shipping and port congestion issue. So getting getting goods back over here. Um, so customers are, and organizations are trying to figure out how do they do that effectively without, because um, you can't just pick up and move your manufacturing. You can't just pick up and change this entire process that has been built out and executed over the last 30 years. So how, how are you strategic um, in kind of building your supply chain globally, regionally, and then um, locally? And so that's, that's one really big key challenge or big key um, common theme that we're hearing about. Um, the next I would say is um, certainly um, initiatives and, and strategic thought around diversity and sustainability. So um, understanding a, a baseline uh, of who you're spending or, or your spend with diverse suppliers, 
um, <clears throat> how can you improve that? How can you create an impact in your local community, in your regional area? So um, that is certainly top of, top of mind for many customers. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, there's kind of different tiers of that. So um, the first and, and the most basic is regulatory, right? So there are certain regulations that are being put in place around sustainability where you have to meet these, these, uh, these metrics. The second would be then um, from a, a brand perspective. So there's, there's a lot of interesting statistics out there right now around um, younger consumers and them wanting to select from brands that are um, not only committed to sustainable practices and, and improving, um, you know, it, it improving our world through their business, um, but they're they're certainly voting with their dollars, and they're actually then protesting when when organizations are not meeting those needs or. Um, you know, there's a flag of forced labor within a supply chain for, I'm sure Megan knows a lot about this on, on the retail side. Um, and so, so there's that brand awareness that, that, that um, organizations are looking at. And then at the top level is really creating sustainable change. So there's organizations like SPP, the Sustainable Procurement Pledge, uh, the UN Global Compact, where um, organizations are joining and committing to working together. They're not necessarily um, trying to keep their competitive competitive edge. They're working together to drive significant change that's impactful. So that's another big piece. Um, I think that the other big um, the other big theme we're we're seeing is really digging down in, into into multi tier. Really understanding your entire supply chain. So there's um, there's all sorts of new regulations coming from President Biden. There's a new supply chain um, uh, act in Germany that requires that you know everyone um, and you are liable if there's some if there's um, an infraction in, in one of those suppliers. And so there's certainly um, customers are and, and organizations are really looking to dig deep and to dig down many, many levels to understand where those risks are. And then um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention cyber. So that's on top of mind for everyone because there's there's so many um, news stories of, of cyber breaches and, and the impact is so great. So we're certainly seeing um, a big awareness and the supply chain teams working with the CIOs to really dig into this cybersecurity issue. And how do we, how do we impact that within the supply chain? Yeah, it's a great, great overview. And it, you know, it, it brings to light the the whole point that it's, you know, when there is a supply chain problem or a breakdown as we're seeing that seeing now, it's not any one thing. You know, a lot of times it's these little things that sort of add up and trickle throughout the entire supply chain. And uh, any one of the things you just mentioned can create problems. But when you add up all those things and they all happen together, which is oftentimes happening nowadays, uh, that creates a lot of the challenge. Um, what about uh, making it, Adam, anything that that we've missed so far or other things you'd add as far as um, some of the the um, challenges, the biggest challenges in supply chains today? I think, Amy, you hit so many, like I actually got kind of stressed thinking about what you're saying. I was like, oh, <laughs> um, so uh, forgive me a minute, I'm, I'm calming down. Um, I think another kind of thing uh, more on the on the lead indicators, uh, not necessarily in the lag, um, would be uh, consumer behavior. I mean, it's just, it's just changing. When my son sends me a text of a shirt that he wants, um, you know, it's not through, you know, the Gap or Nike or even Amazon or Walmart. I mean, it is, it, it's through some, you know, uh, social media channel that he just saw it and he bought it. And, um, and so I think there's, as the consumers are moving around quite a bit, um, you know, at least from our vantage point, um, there's more places to distribute and sell. And so, you know, Amy, to your point, you're having a trouble getting into the back end, right? Like, just getting it to your spot. But then on top of that, um, the, the continued pressure to, uh, you know, get to the consumer as quickly as possible, whether it's a, you know, DoorDash delivery or, you know, a quick shipment or they run and pick it up or whatever. And so there's pressure mounting on, you know, on the, that side too, where uh, we see a lot of suppliers um, and retailers making really unprofitable, unscalable decisions to kind of just win that space for right now. And I think combined with what Amy's talking about from that, you know, just complexity on the back end, um, 
you know, it, it, the math only holds up for so long. And so I think um, I think that's a, another big challenge. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a fun fun time to be in the space. No no shortage of of stressors. What I think what's what's the most interesting to me about about this is this is all happening right as uh, consumer expectations have have really shifted. Um, you know, you can kind of, there's an argument to be made that 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 was starting to happen um before uh before covid came around but covid has made that so much so uh, that i want to have it delivered to my door and i want to know um when it leaves each facility along the way so i can track it so that i know exactly the moment i, I mean i could see the driver on my app coming towards my house with my stuff um and that expectation um you know while that's uh that's a consumer level expectation that's been set. It, it applies to businesses as well, not only because the businesses have to meet that expectation, but they also have that expectation of their partners now because everybody knows that it's possible and everybody knows that I can see this. And as you start to um, have stressors to, to the supply chain, people want to double down on where's my stuff? Because um, now that they know that there's a risk that stuff's not coming, um uh that they, they want to be able to to see it more clearly and have more transparency in it so you kind of have this reinforcing nature which is um the more lag i have the more control i want to have over it and the, uh, as i as i start to see more about that lag and what's happening the more i get stressed out the more i want to change my behavior to fix it and it just creates this cycle that everybody wants to be able to fix um one of the uh one of the things that I, I think is um, we've seen a number of times um, is many, many of our clients have a challenge where it's it's not the actual raw materials for their finished goods that they're having trouble with. It's um, cardboard and pallets. Uh, it's like, they, you know, we've, we've had clients like I could make as much product as I want, but I can't ship it because I don't have pallets. Um, we, we have one client go so far as to buy a pallet company to solve this problem um so that it's it's an interesting type of a, a concept because when you think about um <clears throat> getting product out the door it's not just that packaged item it's everything else that goes out with it including the the plastic wrap i'm sure that'll come up at some point too um and getting things out the door so that uh, <clears throat> we're meeting the, the the needs of consumers yeah, that's a great, great point. And actually a great segue into a follow-up question, which is, you know, we talked about some of these challenges that, that the supply chain in general is facing. And then there's a whole gamut of challenges, a whole variety of things that are contributing to the, to the challenges. But um, Adam, why don't we start with you on this one? But how do you, how do these challenges that we just talked about, um, how do they affect organizations and their operations? And how do you see them reacting? You talked about the client that bought the pallet company. That was one reaction or one way that you could React is do more of that kind of vertical integration of the supply chain or to where you at least have control over over it to some degree. But what else are we seeing, you know, with our client base um, as far as how clients are responding to the to this these supply chain challenges? Yeah, that's a uh, fantastic question. And, and of course, every client has its own response. But the, the general common theme is being able to have greater visibility. Uh, they want to know where things are at and they want um, and, and when it's coming. And then the, the next natural uh, response uh, for most of our client is diversification, uh, especially for, for clients who have had challenges where uh, they're dependent on one vendor for one raw material. Uh, what we've started seeing is a lot of our clients will start to say, well, I can um, I need to start adding vendors to my uh, my list here, um, not only from a perspective of I need to have more than one, but they also start having uh, conversations about quality, right? Normally, my, my demand for quality is very high, but right now my demand for speed is higher. So we've seen clients uh, being willing to say, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be less expensive. It just needs to get here as soon as possible. We'll figure the rest out from there. Um, and what that, that's causing those uh, a continued chain effect, which is now the supplier is paying more for that raw material. And as they resell it in one way or another, their prices are going up. Um, and and that the level of visit the level of visibility that's 
um, not being achieved is compounded because now I have somebody whose uh, raw material price went up and their their price of their finished good needs to be connected to that. But they're not seeing it as clearly as they'd like to because that raw material price goes up, they buy it, and then they put it into their system to be used as a, as a, um, as a raw material to turn into a finished good. And they haven't costed that differently. So their price remains the same and their profits are getting chewed up by that increase in costs that they've ex either accepted or was a surprise to them uh, because they don't have the visibility in their system. So those are some of the more common responses with um, getting more vendors uh, um, and, and loosening up on some of the, the more rigid uh, parameters, cost, quality, um, and in favor of lead time. Yeah, it seems like that there's a lot of um, the supply chains of today have been built for sort of a pre-2020 world where cost and quality were sort of the, the biggest priorities. And now, you know, you've mentioned a couple, Amy, you mentioned sustainability earlier. You know, now there's these other considerations, um, sustainability, flexibility, speed. These are all things now that supply chains weren't necessarily built for prior to 2020, but now they're being strained partly because of the, you know, the world has just completely shifted in the last couple of years with the pandemic and changing customer behavior and all that stuff. Uh, Amy and Megan, what, what else, what did we miss? What other uh, impacts are you seeing to organizations or reactions are you seeing from your customer base in terms of how they, how they deal with this? What are they doing to try and fix some of these problems? Yeah, across the board, um, we are seeing organizations prior to 2020, everyone would react to a risk or react to a disruption. Now organizations, they're expecting them and they're planning for them. So to some of the, the items that Adam spoke to, um, they are absolutely planning, expecting. Uh, I have one customer in the phar pharmaceutical industry who has, has stockpiled three years of supply for their for their key products. And imagine that overhead to carry all of the all of those, all of that. I mean, it's it's an enormous um, financial undertaking, but it's required for them to be able to maintain their business operations, so they're willing to do it. Uh, we have an A&D customer in aerospace and defense. Um, they have um, made sure that all of their parts are within 12 hours of their manufacturing lo locations. And so um, there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of things like that where organizations are completely changing their strategy and their policies to proactively um, try and get a handle on some of these risks that keep popping up and that they've learned are are inevitable. I think that the fragility of um, the supply chain was really highlighted with COVID as different parts of the world shut down, as workers couldn't go into these different facilities. Um, that just kind of highlighted these these challenges and these problems that have been percolating for a long time. Um, and it just tipped it, it tipped the scale. And now we're seeing that cascade of every of the fallout of that. Um, and, and it's going to unfortunately take a long, long time to recover. Um, you know, Vietnam is is a huge manufacturing hub, hub now, and they've just come out of their second set of quarantine at the beginning of October. So getting all of those sites back up and running to deliver the goods, it's a slow roll. So now they're out of it, but who's going to be the next the next location globally where they're stuck? So I certainly think, um, you know, being um, being proactive and thinking that there's going to be challenges here. So what do we need to adjust? And, you know, prior to 2020, um, the supply chain, I, I don't even think consumers knew what the supply chain did. It just is something your, your things just arrived. You clicked a button on Amazon and it just got there. And no one thought twice about how that was going, like the logistics of what had to happen at all the different steps. And so now people understand it. And there's, um, to Megan's point, with the way consumers are responding, they're demanding change and they're demanding things be uh, be more efficient. They're demanding they understand where things are coming from. They're demanding they understand how things are made. So it's, it's a complete shift in the paradigm of supply chain and, and how we're um, how we're consuming it, how organizations are are managing it. Um, it's just, it's going to continue continue to change. I think the top three goals, um, Gartner just released their CSCO report, and I think it was risk management, digitization, and then the work from home. 
Like how do we manage, especially in some of these manufacturing locations, how do we manage our workforce to keep people safe and, and continue to deliver the goods? So it's a very complex, um, complex set of challenges that, that I think are gonna take a very long time um, to start to tackle. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And, and you, you mentioned Vietnam and, you know, I, I wasn't aware that they just had a, another quarantine or lockdown. So it's, it, but that's a good example of how, you know, wherever we are in the world, there's other parts of the world are in different places and having different responses and that's affecting the supply chain globally in, in uneven ways. So that's a really, really interesting point. Um, Megan, what else? What about more from the, you know, sort of the retail distribution customer facing side? How, how are you seeing, is there anything different you're seeing your customers do to react to the supply chain or anything we haven't covered yet? Um, I think I, I really like what Amy and Adam have shared, um, especially around, Amy, when you said, you know, they're changing policies. Like, we never said that three years ago. Like, policies did not change, right? Um, we've all been part of really stiff, big, you know, expensive, profitable organizations where, like, to change a policy is, you know, a decade-long kind of opportunity, right? <laughs> Adam's laughing. <laughs> um, and, you know, each person within that organization has different, you know, tolerance for that understanding. I was always kind of a firecracker that just couldn't, like, like couldn't combust, you know, if, if there was something that inefficient. Um, but what I think what I think we're seeing is not only the policies changing, but leaders are a lot more open to us coming in and saying, hey, you've got an incentive problem here. Literally, like like you can change the policy, but like if your procurement lead is still being incentivized on lowering their carrying costs, he or she is not going to make the decision that's more of a long-term strategic play to stockpile, you know, three years worth of materials in a pharmaceutical company. And so, you know, going back to like, you know, Eli Goldblatt and the goal, I mean, you have to make sure that not only the policies are changing, but also the humans that are, you know, incentivized either, um, you know, um, consciously or unconsciously, right, um, are making those changes as well. So um, I can give an example um, you know, we deal with a, with a major beauty manufacturer and, um, you know, some of their stuff was late and Target, you know, couldn't um, take it all, right? So all of a sudden they have all this, you know, excess holiday and it's, you know, November, you know, 9th. Okay. Well, um, you know, these teams were never incentivized to actually talk to each other. Right. So the Amazon team would come in and take all the excess inventory, throw it online, tank the price, piss Walmart off, you know, piss Target off. Like, and there's just all this inviting. Well, yesterday we were in a war room with leaders from every single one of the retailers to say, guys, how do we like collectively move this inventory to maintain, you know, the, the, um, you know, the integrity that we have with, tar you know, with Target to maintain, you know, the, the promise we have in the markdown levels and that level of just kind of cross channel collaboration. The retailers don't like it because they like to keep people, you know, pretty, pretty motivated to just do what they want to do. But what we talk to brands and manufacturers a lot about is, um, you know, the minute that you break down those silos and incentivize those individual leaders across separate retailers or separate channels to actually, you know, act together for the good of the company, um, you know, we're seeing significant increases. So in, you know, in my area, companies that are breaking down those silos and actually kind of war rooming in real time across multiple retailers are, are outperforming, you know, the old school, you know, kind of siloed like 10 to one. Um, and so, you know, um, how are people reacting? I think in our industry, uh, you know, consumer goods, we're seeing some people do it really, really well. Um, and it's, you know, policy to people kind of thing. And we're seeing other people um, or other companies kind of struggle with it. And it you know, it, it's some combination of policy and people and speed. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, you know, you talk about it a lot, Eric, it's change management. And how do you motivate people to 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 not only you know know the new rules, but to take advantage of them um, is is really where we're seeing some some dramatic shifts in good ways and bad ways. I mean, you know, it's not always when you're shifting. You know, Amy, to your point, when there's like years of you know uh, backlog of you know policies and things, like you're going to make moves that are going to hurt something or someone unintentionally. You just can't. You got to move so fast that you can't uncover all of the unintended consequences. And I think the key thing for leaders 
is to be really listening for those. And the minute that somebody gets their, you know, gets their tail stuck or whatever, that, you know, it's back to the war room. Okay, we didn't anticipate that. How do we change? How do we move? Um, and a lot of that just comes down to, um, you know, data availability, um, data democratization, um, you know, data interpretation across all levels of the of the organization. And, um, and it, it gets really fun. It gets fun when, um, you know, more perspectives are at the table making uh, big decisions in real time. Yeah, you, you hit some really good points there. And I think it um, I think it really underscores this idea or the, the fact that it's not as easy as we, we, it's not as easy to fix the supply chain as just order more stuff, you know, just stockpile more stuff, get three years of inventory, like the pharmaceutical example you gave, Amy. It's not that easy because, uh, well, first of all, you may not have the systems to know how much you, you need to order. You may not have the right processes in place. You may not have the right incentives or the right organizational roles and responsibilities and compensation and all that stuff. So there's a ton of human behavior that needs to change in order for especially these bigger organizations to adapt. Uh, and I think that's, that could be part of the problem we're seeing is it's not as easy as, you know, we can all force it here and say, well, just why don't people just order more stuff or get it there faster? I mean, how hard can it be? Well, it is pretty hard because it's like changing the course of a, of a huge ship. You know, it doesn't just happen overnight. You've got to. Well, and, and to, you know, to Adam's point, you know, what do consumers do when they get nervous, right? They want to control more. They want to know where it is. What do we as, you know, supply chain analysts or procurement partners or, you know, data scientists, what do we do? We try to control more, which is actually the exact opposite of what we need to be doing right now inside of companies. So, you know, we talk about it a lot at Stopwatch. It's this like, it's this tense up and then we all have to remind ourselves, you know what? that tense up is actually causing more, more challenge. So we, I mean, there's a huge incentive, you know, across our organization to just say, Hey, that's a natural reaction. It's natural that you don't want to share that data. I get it, but the game has changed. You with me? And they'll say, yeah, I'm with you. I'm like, all right, then share the data. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Yeah. And that's a big part of what, you know, both uh, stopwatch and craft do, it seems like is provide, different data points and different uh, ways and abilities to analyze the supply chain than what you would traditionally see in, in sort of like a vanilla, you know, ERP system or even a, even supply chain management systems, the traditional supply chain management systems that were more focused on efficiency, throughput, um, cost, you know, tracking costs and all that sort of thing. Whereas now we're talking about something totally different. And so that a lot of the technologies, the legacy technologies that are out there weren't built for this. Uh, they were built for sort of that pre-2020 supply chain. Yeah, so they, they, they were built to stay, to, to, to keep distraction from the company, right? And, and that's a killer way to build software, right? Like the software needs to work in the back end and we need a few people to be focused on it, right? So that, you know, so that the rest of the company can focus on product development, marketing. I mean, it makes total sense. It wasn't like, you know, those systems were built. Um, it's just it's just fascinating, and I think Amy and Adam have both you know touched on it as well that um, that 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 no longer can things be just happening in the background, and it's it's fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I and I would add, um, you know, the, the systems that have been in place for the last thirty years to manage and track supply chain and logistics and and shipping and all of these things that that are are these organizations are working on. Um, were all built very siloed. And the data that was coming into these systems was very siloed or it was incomplete. And, and Eric, as you know, like the, the systems are only as good as the data foundation that's sitting within that tool to be able to report and understand. So you can have the best tool in the world, but if the data isn't there, it's not going to give you the insight to drive the strategy and the impact that you're looking for within an organization. And so that's really where we've started and, and are really, frankly, changing um, the, the supply chain data industry and in that we are aggregating all of these different traditional and alternative data sets. So, and, and the thesis and what is proving correct and impactful for our customers is that looking at all of these different data points, all of these different lenses of risk and opportunity um, is elevating the understanding of that supplier and helping companies proactively 
plan for risks that are going to inevitably come up. But if you can have just a little bit longer of a runway, um, you can be much more strategic in how you manage that and minimize the impact of the organization. And so uh, across the board, the the days of data silos and the days of plat, you know, different platforms that aren't speaking to each other are long gone. And I think as technology continues to improve um, and, and as different algorithms via ML and AI come on board, we're going to start seeing these tools really speak to one another. Um, and, and it's, it's going to elevate um, organizations ability to um, predict and plan for some of these risks and challenges that we're seeing today. And so I think, you know, if, if we talk about supply chain, you know, prior to 2020, um, every it, it just hummed along and it worked and it was low cost and everything, it, things were okay, but there were always these challenges. And now that, um, you know, since COVID hit and, and all of these things are kind of coming to the surface, uh, I think we're going to see over the next 10 years, a dramatic shift in the technology and how things are integrating. And to Megan's point, um, organizations working together to say, hey, you have this, we have this, let's blend it and let's really, um, let's create something that's really impactful for, for the industry. Yeah. So if I might, one of the things that's worth, um, bring it up like two things that I think that came up from from Megan and Amy that are important to, to latch on to a little bit. Um, first is data, of course, <clears throat> you know, being able to, to see it uh, accurately. Um, if you're if your information on your supply chain is bad um, and you have a supply chain problem, you're you're in deep water. Um, and the other uh, the other side of it, though, is that all of this is being driven by people um, it, it won't, in one way or another. You know, I like the example of Vietnam because something that doesn't get spoken to very much and needs a little bit more attention is that, you know, suppliers, when suppliers shut down because they have an outbreak or because they go out of business, that's a piece of the supply chain that's gone, either temporarily or permanently. And so that causes, think of how many, you, you have one supplier that goes down. Think of how many customers they might serve. And then all of a sudden, those customers who are, expecting things to already be coming from them. They have a lead time in their system that says, I'm going to order this from this person and it's going to arrive in 60, 90 days, whatever. And then they don't find out that that, that they went out of business until it's time to order. Okay. So now I'm, now not only do I not um, have somebody to order from, I'm at the point where I need it now. Um, and I had to go find somebody else to fill that in. And um, whether it's because production is slowing down because people are shutting down for whether it be the temporary or permanently, um, whether it's because people are uh, you know, there, the supply chain involves so many things. It involves production, it involves transportation, it involves, um, you know, warehousing and, and, and all and distribution and all of those things that start with creating something, whether it's pulling it from the ground or, uh, or, or building it from scratch and it goes somewhere from there it has to get there somehow and um once it gets to that location it probably that's probably not its its first destination is probably not its last destination its fifth destination is likely not its last destination and so this is why we call it a supply chain right there, there are multiple steps in this and as people are injected into this um you have the, not only the the, the labor shortages um, that are caused by whatever you want to call it, um, you know, shutdowns, uh, uh, outbreaks, the Great Resignation, all of these things um, impact all of those stops, and the, they create bottlenecks because at the end of the day, people are what make this thing go, and then people are what react after it's not going fast enough. So they double down on something that now all of a sudden you're stressing something that's already stressed so that as each step goes along, this impact is compounded. And I think that one of the things that we're going to start seeing a little bit more is people are going to get um, uh, more localized um, and they're going, to, uh, they're going to want to start shrinking the number of stops this takes um, and they're going to get a bit more diversified and, and what it is is acceptable to them. So supplementary uh, uh, raw materials is um, something that people haven't been forced to think about, but now they now they will be because that's, it should be that way. 
Um, st uh, stocking up is an important part of things too. Uh, you know, even before I had a client, even before the even before COVID, with the tariffs on China, basically said, "Well, we do all our manufacturing in China, so we're going to stop stock up um, before these tariffs come into effect, so that we already have that." Um, and, you know, I'd be curious to hear from them if that um, if they ran out of materials at just the wrong time. <laughs> Because for them, it's very likely that um, they're planning for these tariffs. And as those things start to fade away and they start to feel like they can get leaner, bam, here comes COVID. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, the supply chain is disrupted again. I think that what this is showing is that just the, the complexity of not just our supply chain, but of our global economy. Um, you know, we mentioned Vietnam, uh, how, a, um, how a, um, a shutdown in Vietnam can affect uh, affect everybody uh, that think about how many places are, are going to continue to do that. You know, this isn't something that um, is going to go away in the next year, in the next administration, in the next, uh, the, I, I'm willing to bet we're going to be talking about COVID for the rest of our lifetimes, at least the folks that are on, on this call uh, and, and how it, uh, we've seen these trickle down impacts and at the center of it um, are the people and, and placing an emphasis on that is important. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, very much intertwined and interrelated, you know, all this stuff we're talking about. Um, so we're, we're covering the whole gamut here of a lot of different things. There's people, process technology, overall strategy, um, incentives. Uh, uh, a lot of the stuff we talked about so far covers a pretty broad spectrum. But one, one thing I want to come back to, maybe dive into a little bit more, is this whole concept of data and transparency into the supply chain. I think, Amy, you were mentioning that one of the trends you're seeing is that um, people are looking beyond just the immediate supply chain, their immediate suppliers, and they're trying to look to the second and third tier suppliers. And I know, uh, Megan, on your side of kind of your world of where you operate, you're looking at sort of the end consumer. So you're kind of, you know, you really have to look at third tier suppliers of raw materials all the way through manufacturing production, 3PL providers, warehousing, distribution getting it to the retailer getting it to the consumer or getting it to the e-commerce provider getting it to the consumer um but i want to come back to the two products that your company is providing me and megan um and just maybe talk about how you know how do your products provide some of that data and transparency that has been missing from the supply chain so far because i think part of the reason i want to have you on the show is i think that you guys both have products that are i would call them alternatives to the traditional supply chain systems and they, and they provide some of that visibility. So Amy, why don't we start with you? You know, how does, how does craft help solve that data and transparency and visibility problem? Yeah. So thank you for that, Eric. Um, so the craft is collecting and aggregating, um, over 400 different data points on any particular supplier on average. So that is financials, operational human capital, that's cybersecurity scores, um, that's ESG scores, diversity certifications, um, the compliance data, ownership data. And so what that allows organizations to do is to have that single, single source of truth on that supplier. And then as you work through our different, the tool and the dashboards and the alerts and the reporting capabilities, you're able to not only understand what's going on within your supply chain, but we can also map different tiers for you. So now throughout all of these different lenses, whether it be just pure financial risk or compliance risk, um, ESG, so is there forced labor down in your supply chain that's going to that's going to catch you down, you know, once that's exposed. So uh, risk, risk to us is a very large word, right? Because it could be many things. It could be logistics. It could be shipping. It could be materials, commodity inflation. It can be, you know, there's so many different things. And so what, what Kraft is focused on doing is we've created a very easy to use, simple, simple um, platform and interface um, to surface these, these different indicators and to combine these different things to say, hey, your cybersecurity score is very high risk and your employee engagement score is also very high risk. Those two are correlated with an increased percentage of a data breach. So what does that mean to you? So each organization has a different threshold for what their 
uh, for for risk and what they're what they're open to and and how they build out their policies around that. So what we're we're really focused on doing is surfacing all of these insights and then helping our customers take strategic action around that, um, regardless of where they are in the world. We offer 100% coverage. So um, if the data is out there, we will find it. We have a fantastic set of data engineers and a fantastic te technology platform, and that's where uh, I referenced earlier. The, the technology pulling in all of this available data and surfacing it for these organizations is um, is already leaps and bounds ahead of what we had 10 years ago. And it's going to continue to really evolve as, as the ML and AI algorithms continue to evolve. And as, as more data is captured, um, as more data is shared um, between whether it be a survey coming through or, or different things that, that, that organizations are working on. So we're really focused on a very easy to use platform and avail all the available data that, that is relevant to help you understand those suppliers and then make those plans moving forward. Yeah. Imagine it gives your customers a feeling of a bit more control too, because in the past, I would think that it seemed like in the mm -hmm. past, it didn't really matter. The stuff you're talking about didn't matter as much because as long as the stuff showed up and as long as the, the, the vendor is reliable, does it matter what their employee engagement score? Does it matter, you know, what their cybersecurity policy is, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and none of that matters until it does matter. And now it does matter. So right. it's, it's sort of like a good timing for that product, I would think. Yeah. And pe people are seeing now and they're hearing about it in the news. They're, they're seeing it, um, you know, on their own social media people, this is where kind of some of the consumer sentiment stuff comes in. They're seeing it and, and people are, are charged up one way or another about it. And so um, it, it's just, um, it's, it's become a very effective way by combining both traditional and alternative data points to, to have a, a better response and to be proactive. But, you know, like I said, um, Everyone's expecting things now. So if you can just anticipate it a bit, then you can be better prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how about on the distribution, retail, e-commerce side of things, Megan? What are what are some of the, how does your product fit in and how does it provide some of those alternative data sources and alternative ways of operating the supply chain? Yeah, um, first of all, I gotta say, like, I can't wait to check out um, uh, craft. <laughs> um, but we don't, you know, we don't buy, you know, we're not, we don't procure things, but um, I, I'm pretty stoked about kind of that, the idea of that visibility. Um, I think some of our clients could really use it. Um, I think one, um, one thing that Stopwatch is, it does, and because we are on the, on the consumer product side of things, um, it, it sounds really silly, but like this little UPC right here, like, um, you know, when Amy buys this or Adam or anybody on the call buys this at Target, they don't they don't buy it as a Target SKU. Um, they actually well, they do. Actually, that's how it comes in. Right. But they're really they're, they're not saying, oh, there's a Target SKU that I want. They're saying, oh, there's the LaCroix that I want to you know buy. And I happen to be in the space of Target. Right. Um, well, you start kind of extrapolating that out across, you know, any place you can get something that you like from secret deodorant to, you know, a, a toothpaste to trash bags to bag of chips to whatever. Um, all of a sudden, uh, there's, you know, we talked about data engineering. Um, there's just a lot of data engineering to be doing to say, hey, did the consumer mean this and this? Because our systems in black and white numbers are saying that these are two different SKUs because one has a target SKU and one has a, you know, CVS SKU. Well, at the end of the day, the consumer is, 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 you know, LaCroix needs to know what the consumer is wanting, right? Um, not necessarily, you know, the context in which they want it as much as, as much as before. Um, and with the last mile delivery and kind of all that sort of thing. So when we think about the visibility pieces and what Stopwatch does, it basically, you know, as Amy mentioned that um, it sounds like um, uh, the craft kind of, kind of, uh, the main fulcrum is around uh, supplier information. Um, for Stopwatch, the main fulcrum is around single SKU information. Um, and so, you know, GS1 has been working on it for, for years. Um, you know, no, no disrespect, it, I, I don't think they had the technology or the engineering to, to put, put toward it. 
Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of little mini solves, but at the end of the day, um, with the right computer vision, natural language processing, you know, MI, AL, you can actually like pretty much distill everything that's floating around in the universe down to a single point of contact and then blow that back out and see what's actually happening with it. So, you know, in the past, Coca-Cola was always wondering about their market share. Like, you know, do we sell more Coke to people who want to dr drink soda than Pepsi, right? This market share was a big, you know, thing with Nielsen and IRI and, you know, a lot of big data houses. Well, that's a very like lag indicator across a lot of mini choices that have been made over a very compressed period of time, right? And so um, it made sense, right? It, it made sense in the 90s, it made sense even today. But what makes more sense today is to understand in real time where those Coke and Pepsi choices are being made all at the same time. Because when you start looking at it as more of a game theory matrix versus a linear matrix, sorry to get mathy here, you actually can take advantage of your competitors' downfalls. So one thing we talk about a lot um, within Stopwatch is you don't have to be the winner in every single thing. You just have to win when your competitor has made a misstep, right? And so, you know, if, um, this is very general, but, you know, if um, Folger's coffee is stuck on the water, that's public information. So what should Starbucks do? Probably make a different decision than if they didn't know that Folgers Coffee was stuck on the water. Um, and, and I think that's where, where Stopwatch really kind of distills in to say, listen, okay, this SKU, you need to look at this SKU in comparison to its true real-time competitors. And then you need to know what's happening with the SKU and also ha what's happening with its real-time competitors. And when there's a combination of they make a misstep and you make a move, that's where that 10x kind of, you know, arbitrage kind of kind of opportunity happens. And, um, you know, the, the cool thing is, is that we could think about it as humans, but once you get it into a tech stack that it can actually kind of churn that through pretty quickly, um, you know, the game just changes and, uh, and things start moving really, really fast. So um, really Stopwatch is designed to, um, you know, kind of, kind of assign brand marketers and, and manufacturers and people who really know consumer insights, basically their brain activity and how they think about what's happening and put it into a machine learning model that then just picks it up really, really fast. Um, and so we do a lot of supervised learning, you know, with experts in the field and say, okay, how are you thinking about this? Like, you know, if Folgers was stuck on the water, what are your 10, you know, what are 10 things that, you know, Starbucks could do to, um, to capitalize on the opportunity? And you get people who have been working in this field for a long time talking about that. And you, I mean, it's just like, oh my, what a brilliant idea. What, and, and you just couldn't do it because you, you couldn't move things fast or you couldn't tell things to change or the data wasn't connecting. And so that's where we get really excited. I think there's a lot of creative people in in us uh, in supply chain um, that have been constrained by you know time and and barriers and uh, stopwatch's you know real goal is to blow open those time and barriers so that you know people of all different levels of expertise and experience within the supply chain can kind of input and uh, and maximize their opportunity in real time. Yeah, good stuff. That now I've got. That's really that's really interesting, and I, and I think those are two good complementary views of how how data and visibility and just rethinking uh, the supply chain can can help. Um, I've got two quick questions. Normally, I would you know these are two questions that we could easily spend 20, 30 minutes on each of these, but maybe we'll do kind of a lightning round here. And I think um, we sort of agreed before we we went live here that we probably aren't going to cover everything we wanted to, and we probably will have to do a follow up. And I think we probably will because there's a lot here we haven't gotten to. I think we've covered a lot of good stuff, but a lot more we could get to. Um, but just real quickly, I know we're going to want to dive maybe deeper into this than we'll have time for. But just real quickly, um, Amy, I have a question for you about cybersecurity. Um, how is cyber? And you alluded to it a little bit uh, in one of your responses earlier. But what? Um, what? How does cybersecurity affect the supply chain? And what are some of the challenges with that that we're seeing right now? Yeah, I, I there was a statistic that came out um, over the summer, and it was that. Uh, in Q1 of this year, cybersecurity attacks, particularly on a supply chain, were up 
Um, and so th that to me is just staggering. That's not going away. Um, these cyber criminals have realized the impact that a, a supply chain disruption has on not just that one particular organization, but everyone. I mean, the Colonial Pipeline shut down over the summer. The entire eastern seaboard was in a panic, trying to panic buy gas and, and figure out what was going to happen. And so um, the so the overall impact is is massive when some of these things happen. Um, and so it's not going away. Um, there are scores available to help find those vulnerabilities. There are also capabilities um, to understand uh, the deep web, what's already there. And I've, I've actually run this through Craft for a few clients and it's scary how many um, IDs and passwords of senior level executives, CEO, CFO, very, very high level people are floating around the dark web for organizations that I'm not going to name names, but um, the Fortune 500, Fortune 100, their CEO's email and password is exposed on the, on the dark web for someone to buy and create an attack. And so many of these tax, uh, attacks come in through these ID and password issues with these like minor little security things that haven't been updated um, and they, they are able to get in. So, um, so there's that, you know, at the organizational level. And then like I talked about the end tier. So um, some of these attacks are starting this far downstream. I think the solar winds attack um, came in through a supplier many, many levels down and that impacted, I mean, we all remember that one. So, um, I think it's something where organizations are forced to now begin looking at this. The CIOs are now talking to the, the supply chain officers and formulating a plan to understand uh, where do we have vulnerabilities? What do we need to, to do to be uh, more proactive here? Certainly, we're seeing um, organizations requesting their suppliers. So some security questionnaires upon onboarding, making sure that those those um, those things are in place to try and prevent these things uh, because they're only getting more sophisticated and, and they're not going to go away be to, because of the level of disruption that they're causing. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's obviously a big concern. And then you add that, you know, that's of course additive to all the other things we've talked about, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, all the other issues that we've, we've already covered. Um, and then a, another lightning round question that um, I'll ask you, Adam um, is, and this is a, it could be a controversial question. That's why I'm asking you this uh, because I, I know you can handle this one. Uh, but do you think governments will or should start to regulate the supply chain given uh, all the challenges we're seeing right now? And I know there've been some governments like the US government, for example, is talking about potentially taking a more active role in regulating the supply chain. What do you think will happen there as far as regulations and just government involvement in the supply chain given everything else we've just talked about? Yeah, I think that it's, it's important to bring up what we talked about earlier, which is, people trying to exercise more control over what they're doing is causing problems, right? The reacting is causing more problems. And so I, I would say that, <clears throat> and, and this is my opinion, and I'm, I'm of course open to all kinds of uh, feedback on this, but I, I would say that while government has a role in helping uh, with the supply chain and helping loosen some of this up, Regulate, regulating it in a way that it, um, that restricts it um, and is reactive and is designed to try to make something happen is more likely to have unintended consequences that cause more problems. You know, our, our supply chain, we've, we've been talking about today how complex it is um, and, and all of the areas where just one small thing can just create havoc. Um, trying to trying to act like you can make a uh, you can regulate something in a way that you can control all of the the, the undesirable impacts i think is not um is is a bit of a fiction uh that we need to to stay away from but at the same time i do think that governments around the world should have a role in helping ease some of these shortages right so um trying to get shipping containers moved through uh, ports more quickly, especially in areas of the world that are more uh, more constricted. Like what what happens when a shipping container blocks the Suez Canal? <laughs> you know, like there's a role in that for easing that, solving that problem. Um, but then, so and that's that's how I think about it. I'd be curious to see how um, Amy and Megan think about it as well as supply chain experts. 
yeah, any any thoughts on that, Megan or Amy? I, I completely agree, Adam. I, I I think it's it's so complex that that a series of regulations aren't going to solve the problem, right? I, I I think there are ways that small small things can make an impact. For instance, in Southern California, now our ports are now uh, operating twenty four seven to try and get things off of these ships and to kind of ease some of that congestion. Is that going to solve everything overnight? No, but it's a start. I think. Um, so I, I I certainly think. Um, the visibility is um, is going to be impact impactful. The fact that President Biden is is putting this stuff out there, I think, um, is going to be impactful for organizations to really force them to continue to evolve and to look at change. Like Megan was saying earlier, change is very very hard. Um, but I think when there's this this um, visibility on a global scale, I, I think it does. Um, it helps drive some of those some of those changes that are are inevitably coming. So, yeah. Now, what about just as a kind of a closing question? I'll start with you, Megan. Um, what what one or two things in closing would you say that organizations and teams within organizations should be doing to kind of rethink their supply chain and really start to fix and alleviate some of these problems? If you had to summarize it, one or two things, what what would that be? This is gonna be crazy, but talk to more teenagers. What truly? Talk to teenagers. Things that are really, really complex in our in our minds. Um, when you when you sit and talk to a kid between thirteen and eighteen, um, it's not as complex in their minds. And if we can get out of our own way and start to kind of look at things the way they are, um, I'm I'm just always always shocked at at how you know. Uh, there's Occam's, there's Occam's razor opportunities, um, but we've been really predispositioned uh, to to not necessarily pick those out. Right, right. That's a good point. Yeah, sometimes we overthink things, overcomplicate it, and that's the last thing the supply chain needs right now is more complication because there's already enough enough moving parts as it is. Um, how about you, Adam? What what uh, one or two things would you say in closing as sort of a, a takeaway or something for organizations to think about? Yeah, I'd say start looking at it earlier in your process. Um, get ahead of it and don't be as reactive as you feel like you have to be. Um, if you can start seeing what your key, your most critical raw materials are, your most com critical components and understand that um, at some point that's going to be impacted by a supply chain issue, seeing it farther in advance. You know, it's a, my lead time on this is 30 days. That's pretty good. Um, we'll look at it. 60 days before that start to think about what happens when your lead times get uh get expanded because th these panic buys and all those things they happen fast i mean like i don't think the great toilet paper shortage of of 2020 is ever going to be forgotten um and that type of thing it just it happens fast and it's it, you trying to react to that in a way um, that is um, short-sighted, I think is a is a is a difficult position to be in. So knowing what your 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 key components are, your key raw materials, and and really getting way ahead of that, knowing what all of your options are, so that you can adjust, is going to really be a, a really impactful thing for your business. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Amy? What what closing uh, advice or recommendations would you have for organizations? Yeah, I would just say leverage the digital tools that are available um, to understand these multiple dimensions of risk across your organization, um, and and um, leverage that to to be more strategic to um, to plan for these things. They're going to happen. Um, this has, you know the fragility of the entire supply chain, the global ecosystem has been exposed. And so um, now it becomes kind of this new era of planning and, and managing to that and, and changing um, particularly large organizations. It's very, very difficult to do, but we're starting to see that. And I think it's gonna continue to evolve, but I would just say to, to leverage um, the, the digital tools to, to manage the risk and, and to figure out what that means for your organization and plan around it. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Well, I'll actually, sorry, I'll jump, jump in kind of on that. And I would, I would go one step further, Amy, and this kind of goes with my teenager thing is, is leverage digital tools that don't suck. Like, and I say that <laughs> with all love, because I think what's really interesting is as consumers and people out in the world on the weekends, like we have our phones and we're like chilling in Mint and Uber and like really good technology. And then we come in on Monday morning and we sit in front of our mainframe and we're not demanding, you know, the same level of uh, user experience and visibility and accessibility and those sorts of things. And so, you know, I think I think one thing that's really important for for teens to realize is that you're going to be more effective when you're working kind of, you know, quickly. Um, and there are a lot of great tools out there that, you know, just don't don't suck, um, you know. And uh, and I, I think it's important to explore those um, because. It's amazing how much how much faster things go and how much happier you are when uh, you're just working kind of you know in your brainwave that that kind of makes sense versus having to relearn an old system. It's kind of yeah. that old adage like work smarter, not harder, right? Like let's be more effective in what we're doing and how we're doing it across the board. And, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with getting simple. You know, the, uh, there's a comment in the yeah, right. Exactly. There's a comment here. What about trying to shorten the supply chain? That's a great idea, right? If you can start, if you can get more direct, you can simplify this problem. Um, not only do you reduce your exposure to it, but you you improve your ability to res be responsive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of good stuff here. And, it, you know, this is all interesting timing, especially as we come up on the holiday season for much of the world um, in November and December. That's part of why I wanted to have this this roundtable with you all um, here today. So um, this is great stuff. And, it, and like I said, I think I, I definitely want to do a part two with you guys if you're open to it. I think uh, there's yeah. a lot more we can dive into here. So I uh, want to want to thank you for your time. This is really good stuff. I uh, really appreciate having all three of you on the show uh, here today. So thank you very much for being here. And then uh, thank you to the audience for being here. Uh, thanks for joining. You can find this interview. Uh, you're, you're part of a, uh, a live recording, obviously, uh, listening here today. Uh, we're going to make it part of our Transformation Ground Control podcast that comes out uh, next week, uh, a week from tomorrow. Actually, it'll be out. So be sure to keep an eye out for that the uh, the more polished version of this discussion, along with other content that will go into that, that podcast. And uh, be sure to check out Stopwatch and Craft, too, especially if you're looking for alternative technologies that aren't sort of your usual uh, ERP or supply chain types of solutions. They're, um, they're, they're just good examples of alternatives that are out there. You don't have to settle for the technology that sucks to use Megan's uh, term. Not that all the other technology <laughs> necessarily sucks, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Thanks again for being here, everyone. Have a great rest of your, your, uh, week and I hope to see you all soon. Take care.